Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, the hour being three o'clock, I'll call this regular meeting of town council to order this uh, 13th day of September, 2021. We have an agenda before us, or are there any additions or deletions? Yes, your worship, uh, under 4.1. Uh, delegation public art policy uh, they like to uh, reschedule uh, we'll, we'll not be joining council today with also the addition of 9.1 uh, council reports uh, request from councilor hill for committee's reappointment okay that is for say again um, uh, 9.1 yes uh, request for a committee reappointment okay. under councilor hill's reports Okay, all right. All right. Any, anything else? Uh, if not, would someone like to move we adopt the agenda as uh, amended? Your Worship, I'll move that we adopt the agenda as amended. Thank you, Councillor <laughs> Beans. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you. First thing on the agenda, the minutes of the regular council meeting of August 23rd for consideration. Would someone like to move we adopt those minutes as submitted? Your Worship, I would move the minutes as presented. Thank you, Councillor Hill. There are any errors or omissions to be noted in those minutes? No? All in favor of the motion, carried. Next item is the uh, minutes of the agenda and priorities meeting of September 7th for consideration. Would someone like to move we adopt those minutes as submitted? Also move your worship. Thank you, Councilor Barkley. Any errors or omissions to note? Not all in favor of the motion. <laughs> Carried, thank you. And uh, next are the uh, minutes of the special council meeting of September 7th for consideration. Would someone like to move we adopt those minutes as submitted? I would so move, Your Worship. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Harrison. Any errors or omissions? All in favor of the motion. Carried. Thank you. Um, moving on to delegations, we have uh, HCMA architects regarding multiplex. I'll, I'll take that on your worship, Bob, um, yeah. and then I'll pass it over to, to Megan. Is back in, I think it was the first quarter of 2018, where council passed your um, strategic plan, and you identified uh, recreation amenities and social gathering spaces as a, a priority. It wasn't until a little bit later in your term, probably halfway through around May of 2020, where council gave direction to, an R, to do an RFP request for proposal for consulting services for aquatic center modernization and pre-designed plan. Obviously from that initial scope, uh, we uh, council ultimately, as we stepped through the process, council identified that, hey, we, we're looking a little bit short. Uh, let's look at just uh, the well-being of the aquatic center, but let's look at a bigger picture um, of a recreation and community center. So today we would like to present to you that pre-designed report to you. You've had glimpses of this information within your strategic planning meetings um, for, for quite some time. Um, ideally, uh, we would uh, recommend that council consider adopting this report, which makes it a working document for, for, for next council for consideration uh, based on your comfort to do that. So. I'd like to put that on over to Megan and then on to uh, Michael with HCMA. So, Megan. Okay, so again, not a lot to add from, from what Todd has said, but uh, this report is a, the result of a process that highlights the challenges and the complexities of making this type of decision. Uh, again, the age and condition of the aquatic center prompted the investigation into a renovation, expansion, or replacement of the pool. Uh, that did lead into a more comprehensive conversation on other facilities and desired amenities. Uh, in the end, we are left with a lot more knowledge and understanding to support the decision that needs to be made. Uh, the process with HCMA is forced an examination of service levels, community expectations, and the town's financial realities. Uh, so this report will provide context and clarity for incoming council uh, to lead the town in the responsible renewable, renewal of our facilities. Um, so yeah, I will turn it over to to Michael to, 
to walk us through. He probably won't get us through the entire 420 pages of the report, <laughs> but we'll hit the hit the high points for council. So I'll give it to you, Michael. Thank you, Todd and Megan, and uh, good afternoon, your worship and members of council. Uh, thanks for having uh, HCMA back uh, in one of your regular sessions. Welcome, uh, Megan is correct. I will not take you through 400 pages. Um, I, in the past, I know I've given some long presentations. I'm going to try to make this one a bit um, brief and to the point uh, to allow a bit more time for uh, questions and, and answers because I know that this isn't, um, it, it, it's not necessarily a linear process with what we've done. It's it, in many aspects has probably uh, un, unveiled more questions. So. Uh, I think the question and answer period is really important here. Um, before I share my screen and start, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Or I see I see some heads nodding. I'm sorry. What was yes, your... we can hear you. Yeah, everything seems to be fine, Michael. Perfect. Okay, I will share my screen and. Oh, it does say the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Try again there now. There we go. And I'll go full screen. Um, and so Todd and Megan, I did say that I wasn't going to show any images from the previous studies, um, but when I was Assembling the slide deck, it really seemed to make sense just to have a few images in. Um, this project has been occurring over a, a, a significant period of time, and I thought it'd be good just to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, so jumping right in, as uh, Todd had explained in his intro, um, this project started by looking at uh, your aquatic center um, and the original RFP asked us to look into a renovation, an addition, or a new build on the same site. Um, <clears throat> the uh, renovation was really looking at what can we do within the existing walls. The addition looked at um, adding a modest increase of area to the east side of the building, and then the new build was um, creating a brand new building with comparable services just so that they could be compared uh, apples to apples in a, in a, a cost analysis. Um, as Todd mentioned, that led to council asking for an additional study um, that in terms of long-term strategic planning, it could be a benefit to the town to consider consolidating um, the aquatic program with um, with additional program at the Twin Arena site um, with the introduction of a multiplex and recreation center. And so HCMA um, moved to the Twin Arena site um, and we've presented to this to you in the past. I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on it, um, but it was a large field house with both a hard court and soft court, uh, artificial turf, uh, a renewed curling rink, and uh, aquatic center, a brand new aquatic center, all connected to the twin arena with a new front entrance for the building. Um, part of the uh, rationale on how to make this feasible, there was a notion of construction sequencing, construction phasing um, that would have the field house and some community programs as a phase one um, with the curling center aquatics and the um, revised renewed front door of the building falling in phase two. Uh, and, and although there was some excellent um, value and, and ideas brought forth in this, uh, some of the shortcomings were one, um, in phase one, you're not getting a renewed aquatic center. And, and that is uh, uh, that is indicates the biggest need in the community at the moment. Um, Two, it was requiring a lot of alterations and changes to the twin arena building. By doing this, you open up um, the building to be to have to meet uh, current code, uh, building code requirements, which can have a substantial cost to um, the project just by having to upgrade structure and, and all sorts of um, building code requirements on the twin arena building. And, um, and the construction cost. Uh, 
there was a lot of building here. There was a lot of area. And um, when we went to look at the uh, cost estimate that was provided by BTY cost consultants, um, for the first three options, um, we were looking at a construction budget of under 5 million for the renovation, 7.7 .7 for the addition to the aquatic center, uh, 14 million for the new build, but then this multiplex at the Twin Arena site was jumping up to 65 million and, and um, uh, you know, a, a very substantial price tag. Um, so as you know, we were instructed to reevaluate the um, multiplex idea to find ways to bring it closer to a construction cost of $25 million. And um, that's really, I, I just wanted to give that as a, as a refresher. I, I, I know everyone's been shown this information before, but I thought it'd be useful to see that. So this programming phase of, of looking to determine the size and feel of a multiplex of 25 million. There was a couple items that the consultant team first thought would be best um, to discuss with council and with administration at the town of Innisfil. Uh, one of them was project budget versus construction budget. And, and we had a, a session, a, a Zoom session, just to kind of outline the differences. Uh, we often differentiate them as hard costs and soft costs. Um, hard costs are the cost of physically constructing your building, the, the materials, labor, and land, uh, where soft costs are everything else, professional fees, permits, uh, project administration costs. And um, we noticed in when we were presenting the multiplex that um, there was a few comments made and, and we really wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page for overall costs. Uh, compared to construction costs, just so that um, there wasn't misalignment in expectations. So that was one workshop that uh, was conducted in this programming phase. Uh, another one was sustainability. And um, Rebecca Holt from HCMA's Vancouver office gave a, a very detailed presentation. And, and I know there was a lot of information in it. I'm not going to go through it all now. Um, but the, the kind of main takeaway from my perspective is you really want to set goals for sustainability as early as possible in a project. The longer it's, uh, the longer a client waits to set those goals, the more expensive they have or the greater implications they have on uh, project budget. And um, there is lots of data out there showing that um, they can often be incorporated at uh, Kind of neutral cost if done in the beginning of the project. Um, some of the accessibility or some of the sustainability rating systems that Rebecca mentioned that could be applicable to the town of Innisfil for this project was the Rick Hansen Foundation, which is a certification system for inclusive design and accessibility. Um, LEAD, which I know the town of Innisfil is already familiar with, the leadership in energy and environmental design. Um, and zero carbon building. And um, her point for zero carbon building is that uh, as we see carbon becoming something that's taxed and has a cost associated with it, um, it is going to affect annual operational costs. And um, the more that that can be addressed in design phases, uh, the bigger impact in savings um, a building can have over the years. Um, and, and with, as we mentioned, with any of the sustainability items, HCMA is more than happy to help with any further questions or discussions on this topic. Um, then, then I think what one of the items we wanted to talk about was um, uh, the, the workshops, the, the stakeholder workshops. thought it would be really beneficial in this phase um, prior to um, laying out Footprint and that floor plan for this reduced to multiplex to set up some hard um, stakeholder uh, work. Michael, so Michael, we, we seem to be having an audio issue here. There. Oh. There. Try that. How about now? Can you hear me better, Mayor? I think so. 
Yeah. I'm going to try. I just stopped sharing to see if that solves it. Is that able to hear now? Yeah, I think so. I am getting a bit of lag on my end, to be honest. Uh, my video, I might turn my video off and continue to share. Uh, Michael, it's still yeah, breaking up. Audio is... Sorry, Michael, it's still breaking up badly here. I might need to uh, that might be the best my audience to feel that. Okay, I'll I'll and return back. Okay. Are you there, Michael? No. Still got the audio by breakup. It's actually broken on you back now. Yeah. Michael, if are you there? He's gone now. So I think we can probably, you know, try and reschedule. Him. Megan, if you could contact him and put him down a little bit later on the agenda, perhaps. Yeah. Give him a so that suggests um Maybe four o'clock. Okay. Okay, we'll we'll do that. We'll we'll try again at something like four o'clock or whatever after you get in touch with them. Okay, uh, let's move on then to the CEO's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Your Worship. Um, a few items to, to uh, go through with you verbally, so I didn't get a report into your your pack. Um, just what first of all, the Policing and Safe Communities Committee Council um, had to express some interest to meet uh, collectively with that committee. Um, that committee is gonna be meeting on September 29th. 
uh, five o'clock, uh, likely at the LLC. Uh, once the agenda is confirmed, we'll forward it to council as well. So hopefully it does fit within your within your calendars. Um, again, Place and Safe Communities Committee joint meeting with council September 29th. And again, if it poses concern with you, uh, please please let myself know, and I'll we'll see what we can do. Okay. Okay, so a few other items, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I attended a virtual meeting between the AUMA Safe and Healthy Communities Committee and this AUMA Small Towns Committee with, uh, with uh, the Municipal Affairs staff regarding funding of libraries. Um, there has been a stakeholder engagement with from Municipal Affairs since, since uh, 2019. This follows suit to an AUMA resolution um, the resolution that was uh, approved by by uh, members of AUMA was asking municipal affairs to update data in calculating provincial operating grants. Um, the ministry currently uses a 2016 population data. So you, you might've heard of this a little bit, um, but where AUMA stands right now is to uh, have municipal affairs maintain the 2016 population numbers due to the in-migration within the province from smaller communities to the larger centers where the smaller centers will be receiving less, less dollars to operate their, their libraries, uh, whereas the bigger centers would be then accumulating um, those dollars. The challenge is that the province currently funds libraries within, within Alberta, $30.5 million uh, through grants to municipalities. So I just wanna bring that to your attention. Um, you'll hear that now and into the, into the near future. And then also I know, I think it's Council Rebreger men mentioned a while ago, perhaps um, that also population of communities, 10,000 or more will require a master's librarian, which means uh, a, a librarian within communities for the population of 10,000 or more would require the librarian to have a master's degree. Also the we hosted, the town hosted a candidate's information session last Thursday is the second session that we hosted um, through Ian McCormick of Strategic Steps. And in total of the two um, engagements, I'd say up to close to 30 participants, 28 to 30, which is well attended, uh, really good sessions. Um, and I believe those that attended uh, received um, a quick and dirty, what the life, life would be um, as a elected official. I attended a AUMA Safe and Healthy Communities Committee meeting on September 10th in Edmonton. It was our final committee meeting um, of, the, the, of the last year. Um, and right now the committee is just finalizing their priorities as recommended to their board. Um, and those include uh, continuing on with justice and policing as a priority. Also advocating for improvements to the provincial mental health and addiction system, which is certainly rapid now in our communities advocating for improvements to the provincial affordable housing system, as well as the EMS uh, first responder, which will be part of the agenda. We'll talk about locally uh, what is occurring um, at that joint meeting with the Police and Safe Communities Committee. A few um, events that I attended was included the Community Partners in Action presentation and awards uh, ceremony. Um, the rodeo parade, and of course the Rotary Golf Tournament, which occurred last week. There was a question posed to me regarding uh, council meetings and AMP meetings um, from now on to the rest of your, your term. Um, we, we connected this morning as the senior leadership team uh, to forecast upcoming requests for decisions or information items council needs to be made aware of. Um, and right now there are action items identified um, right up to the 12th of October that will require some involvement of council um, and your di formal direction for consider consideration. We anticipate those agendas be quite light, um, but there's some things we need from you within your term. Um, there's potential of looking at canceling the AMP of October the 5th, um, but we'll certainly maybe look at that over the next couple of weeks as well. Um, I think that if there's any questions to my to my report or anything else, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Do we want to um, uh, discuss 
council meetings in, in the proximity of the election, our election on the 18th. Um, obviously we wouldn't be conducting a council meeting on, Mon on Monday the 18th, but um, where are we at? I changed. Anyways, uh, with my thought at least anyways, is that uh, for sure there'd be no council meeting on the 18th of October. Correct. But uh, do you do you want to continue with one on the 11th as well? What's it, maybe just on to the SLT and just kind of comb through the, the rest of the dates and just kind of okay. maybe have this conversation with council if you like. Sure. Um, so September 20th, I'm just wondering, I know we had one item, SLT, that's what, Potentially could we move that to a regular council meeting on the 27th? Would that create any issues? Or as a delegation? Okay, so we'll try to consolidate as much as we okay. can to kind of tighten things up. Yeah. I think that's probably your, maybe your hopes perhaps, yeah. but um, for sure we'll require a, a motion of the 18th, I believe, to cancel that meeting. We'll come back to you at the next regular council meeting with, with that request for decision. Um, if the council doesn't mind, we'll maintain the 20th. Um, we'll confirm um, if the delegation, um, and I'll just give you a kind of a idea what it is. It's regarding the um, our facilities and investment for, for um, uh, energy savings, renewable energies, and it's, it's quite important. Um, documents and uh, something for council to consider and, and move on likely to new council, but uh, we do have a delegation scout right now to have to present that uh, quite detailed report. All right, well, that's fine for now. And uh, are there any other questions of the CAO in this report? Okay, uh, then I would I would accept the uh, motion to accept his report. I so move, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harrison. All in favor of the motion. Carried. Then the uh, control action or council action control uh, document there that. I have, is there anything you'd like to discuss on that? No? Okay, well, would someone like to move we accept this for information? I'll move that, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bates. All in favor of the motion? Carried. All right, uh, operation services. We have an RFD regarding waste collection contract. I think Michael's back on from HCMA if we want to oh. just see if he's if he's working any better. I am Megan. Um, I, I apologize about that before. It sounds like my audio is working better now, but can everyone hear me okay? Sure. I think we can go ahead. Is that fine with everyone? Yeah. Okay, I, what I'll do is I'll keep my video off. Um, hopefully it doesn't happen again. Um, Megan, I do have my phone in front of me. If, if my audio is, gets really bad, you can just um, send me an email or text me and I'll, uh, but hopefully, hopefully we don't have any more problems. Good. Okay, well, I'll go back to the presentation. Um, I was, I don't know at what point my audio uh, started to uh, fail, um, but after the sustainability uh, workshop, we really dove into the stakeholders workshops and I, the goal of the stakeholder workshops was to speak directly to different um, targeted groups within Innisfil on the themes of wellness, on the themes of the field house, aquatics and curling, 
to really best understand what the multiplex needs to be um, to really find an efficient layout and, and an efficient program. Um, so the first workshop we had was wellness. <clears throat> and um, often when we say wellness, we're talking about a lot of the non-recreation programming. That's the, the multi-purpose rooms, the informal seating, the cafe, um, all of the areas outside of the formal uh, recreation programming that allow the building and site to be a destination for community and, and just an inclusive um, amenity. And um, we heard a lot of support for the project and especially the, the framework of it being a center for wellness. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the feedback really reaffirmed the multi-purpose rooms and, um, and, and as well as exterior programming for the nicer summer months of the year in how um, exterior programming could support and complement uh, uh, some of the community programming that already exists within Innisfil. The next workshop we had was aquatics. Um, there wasn't uh, a lot of the aquatics themes had already been discussed in the first stages of the project when we were analyzing the existing aquatic center. Um, it's important to note though that um, there were some useful comments made about items such as the lap pool in that previously it was assumed through the renovation or addition that the existing lap pool would remain as is. And if it is a new build, everything is open um, to be determined. And, um, you know, there was some comments made on how if the lap pool was eight lanes instead of six, it opens up more opportunities. If the depth of the lap pool increases, um, <clears throat> that there could be a greater number of the events or competition uh, swim meets held at the center. But in general, most of the items had already been addressed in the earlier phases of the project. Uh, the field house workshop was very uh, instrumental in that uh, currently the town of Innisfil does not have a, a soft court or artificial turf uh, indoor field. So there was a lot of um, creative commentary on how um, a, a soft court turf field could add a lot of value. Um, and eliminate the need in some instances to have to drive to neighboring communities to, to, uh, for games and, and practice, um, and that it could be a business draw for other neighboring uh, areas to be able to come and, and rent the, this facility if it was built. And then the curling workshop, um, this was probably the most uh, eye-opening one in that when we did meet with um, the Curling Association as well as the, um, sorry, let me just look at my notes. The uh, Shuffleboard Association, um, although both groups expressed interest in a renewed facility, um, really when we asked them specifically whether a renewed building is required, um, they both said no, and that the existing building really is meeting and serving their needs, and, and they feel has a lot of life left in it. Um, and, and so this was quite instrumental, because um, from Council's previous mandate, we really were looking for efficiencies in how we could bring down that budget. And to hear specifically from the stakeholders and the users of the curling building that uh, a new facility is not required. Uh, we really saw this, um, and we discussed it with administration, but we really saw this as a step that does not need to occur in this revised and reduced multiplex, and that we should really plan around um, keeping and maintaining the curling center. So we took the information from those four workshops um, and, and to revisit the multiplex design that we had provided um, previously. And, and our, with our main goal of really providing the same um, function and programming that we had previously, 
uh, minus the curling center, but really looking at how uh, efficient can we be spatially so that we can reduce the construction cost. Um, and, and the report goes into a lot more detail for the presentation. I'm really just jumping straight into the site plan. Um, so here you're looking at the, if you can see my mouse, you, it's the twin arena um, on the bottom left in gray, curling center on the bottom right, 42nd Street running east-west on the bottom. Um, and then we're showing in this uh, pink zone, the footprint of the new multiplex. And our rationale for placing it here was one, we wanted to maintain the curling center and, and, and knowing that it's serving the needs of its users and also that's a cost savings to the project. Um, two, for the purposes of discussion for this phase, we did place it a bit further north on the site. Um, we saw opportunities around the curling center, uh, sorry, around the new multiplex for some outdoor programming. Uh, we know that the greater park here is, is well used and, and especially the baseball diamonds um, are, are very active, but we also wanted to explore the idea of some smaller areas that could be programmed to, to link these buildings together in the absence of them not being physically linked. Um, that being said, uh, if a scheme like this one were to move forward, uh, this building could definitely be located further south to be closer to the other existing buildings. Um, other key elements in this site plan was um, similar to the previous multiplex is the addition of parking here uh, to serve the new center, but also to serve the park. Um, we were showing uh, the possibility of relocating the playground and um, a potential to have a spray park just for ways to activate the park as well. Uh, the main building entrances are shown in the pink triangles here um, from the uh, west and from the, the south edge. Uh, and we do see that this could be um, the dash lines here being covered walkways connecting all of these so that uh, in the absence of a of a heated indoor connection, there could be a covered walkway to um, give people a better access route in, in the winter months or on a day with heavy rain. Moving in on the main floor plan, so this is a two-story building we've proposed, um, and it's you can just see there's a lot less corridor, there's a lot less circulation. Uh, we really did work hard at trying to find as an efficient a footprint as possible. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of rooms here, but the, the simple explanation is to the north, you have your aquatic center and you have your change rooms, um, the gender neutral universal change rooms, and then the male and female. Um, so that's the north block. The south block is the field house. And so we're showing the field house being sized um, for one indoor soccer field, but I have a slide following that will show all the different options. There's eight team rooms, four here and four over here um, that could be configured in many different ways. Um, some of them um, can be gender change rooms. Um, they could all be team rooms. Even we were playing with the idea that two of them could be access from the exterior to support the baseball diamond activity. Um, when the facilities close, there could still be change room and washroom access. To the west of the building is really your, your um, community hub where you have your entrances, a cafe, um, multi-purpose rooms. Um, number three is multi-purpose rooms. The one here we saw as uh, playing double duty in that it could be a dedicated community multi-purpose room. It could also be a teaching room um, for the aquatic center for their classes and so forth. It could be fully glazed and open on. Um, these two mid-sized multi-purpose rooms are shown with the dash line. There was a strong need in the engagement for a large 100 person multi-purpose room. And um, we sometimes see those larger rooms getting built, but then not used that often because 
generally smaller room needs are more frequent than the large ones. Um, so we did think it would probably be just better use of space to show two medium sized ones that could be when needed turned into a large room. And then we're showing um, uh, a hint at some of the outdoor programming, but um, again, I, I think the focus right now is more on, on, on the main floor interior programming. Um, there's a central staircase and elevator here to take you up to the second floor um, where we do have our fitness and exercise room. We have some staff offices um, and we're also showing uh, fitness exercise area um, around the running track um, just to provide a whole range of options for classes and activities and, and, and using different types of machines. The overall um, area of this multiplex, this reduced one, is about half the area of the one that we had shown you previously. Um, in the report, we have a bunch of different kind of precedent images that show some of these ideas. I think the report does a better job of explaining um, some of the uh, the, the feeling and, and the atmosphere for some of these spaces, but I just wanted to include them in here um, just in the event that you haven't read the report yet, it would be it's a really useful section to get an understanding. Like for example, when we show the fitness machine and equipment up here, you know, we see it as a way to really activate the entire building just to see people exercising um, and, and active in this community building. Um, this, this was included in the report just to show all the different options for activity and sports in a turf indoor field. Uh, there would be more, but we really just wanted to get, give the town an understanding, the flexibility. Um, and really, this is all just sports, but there's other types of activities and community events that uh, we could see this field house supporting. Um, and of course, with this, we had BTY provided an updated cost estimate. And um, it, this cost estimate was produced in um, the thick of some of the global supply chain issue shortages we were seeing um, earlier this year in COVID. We're still seeing some of them. Things like wood have come down in price to a more reasonable level, but we're still seeing steel and, and other items being very expensive. Um, so this second line here that says construction cost, um, that's coming up to almost $34 million. They, they were indicating that this is a easy 10, if not more percent higher than what they would normally see. And that this would probably be more in the range of 27 million in pre-COVID numbers. Now, that doesn't mean that much because um, a lot of these numbers will never go back down to where they were before. Uh, but uh, I, I did want to use it as a rationale for why this turned out to be larger than what we had anticipated. Um, including the cost consultants, everyone was pretty surprised by this number. Um, the, it, with the contingencies that are added to every project, and at this point uh, in a project, it's 20% is used for contingencies. And, and as we mentioned previously, contingencies aren't, it isn't guaranteed they're gonna be used. Um, well, it's always plus or minus, sometimes it's less. But you want you do want to account for it at this point because there's definitely projects that do use it, and if you don't account for it, um, your project budget may fall short. Um, so the adding the contingencies brings the overall project budget, the sorry the 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 construction cost with escalation up to 41 million, um, which when we compare it to um, the previous four options, so option one, sorry, these aren't labeled, is renovation. Option two is addition. Option three is the new aquatic center at the existing site. Option four was the large multiplex. Um, and then option five is the reduced one. And, you know, I'm just noticing the numbers in the previous slide didn't line up 
with uh, this one. Um, this is the, ex the correct one, though, the 41 million. Uh, we had a few things revised, uh, and, and this is the correct number here. Um, but uh, I mentioned that this option five is 50% the area, half the area of option four, yet you're not seeing uh, a direct correlation with the uh, construction costs. And, and our cost consultant explained that that is typical. You know, you still, just because you reduce your field house in half, you still have the uh, essentially a lot of the same mechanical equipment to service that. So even though you're reducing the area by half, you don't see that same um, transfer into the construction costs. Um, but keep in mind that this construction cost for option five does include some of the higher prices that we've seen because of COVID. In the report, the next step section, I was reading over it today before this presentation, and um, it does give a lot of uh, useful steps to take as this project moves into the next step. But what it doesn't really identify is the big decision that the town of Innisfil has is how best to move forward. Um, usually how we want to leave a client in situations like this is a clear path on, on how they move forward into the next step and what the best solution for them is. And um, we, we understand it's not that clear in this case and that um, there's, there's, I'm sure from your perspective, some easy um, pros and cons to all of these options and that I'm, I'm sure there's still quite a bit of internal discussion needed to really understand how best to move this project forward. Um, the last slide I had was really just also illustrating how early this is in the project phase timeline. So the far left bubble here being pre-design, that's, that's what I would describe what we've gone through. Um, the next phases are the two design phases, schematic design and design de development. Um, after that is construction documents where you create the drawings that a contractor uses to build it. And then you move into your construction phase and after that occupancy. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now. I, I really just wanted to give a high level. I'm gonna try turning my video on a high level overview of, of our findings and, and, the, and the updated floor plans. Um, really happy to take any questions you might have to, to better clarify this. Any, uh, any questions, Council? Council Barkley? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, uh, through to Michael. So Michael, the, the soft costs for this latest design approximately, so it, it, a lot of it would come um, in how the town of Innisfil structures the project. Um, so one of it is, uh, one of the soft costs would be consultant fees. So it, it would depend on how you procure your consultants or how you structure the awarding of the work. Um, another one is project management. Um, so if, uh, if a company that, specializes in project management, if they're brought in, that might raise fees a bit. If, if the project management is hand, handled internally with the town, then that would probably have reduced fees. Um, the, the short of it is, and, and this was something that BTY mentioned, is they, they see a range of anywhere from 12 to 20% of soft costs rep based on the construction estimate. So it does, it does add a bit, it is a significant amount, uh, but there's no set number on what that percentage is because it varies from project to project. Okay, thank you. And just one more question. So with respect to the field house, the surface of the field house, is that relevant uh, basically to the size of uh, the arena as far as the, the surface goes? Um, in, in terms of like how big is the yes. field house mm -hmm. compared? Well, for the for the arena, you have two rinks, you have two sheets of ice. Yeah. Um, 
So I, it, it wouldn't be as large as that because we're, um, we're now proposing a single field house, whereas the previous version had, had two, uh, two fields uh, side by side. And so it, it would be smaller. I could send through a diagram showing the size of it in comparison to the twin arena just to uh, easily illustrate the size difference. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just questioning the size of the surface compared to the size of the ice surface. Like, would it be 75% of the ice surface size approximately or just ballpark it? It doesn't matter. Yeah, I would say, um, I would say, I guess um, if when you combine the two ice sheets, uh, yeah, I, I would say it might be around the 75%, but I am, I'm just basing that off of the site plan that I'm looking at. I, I would feel better if I just followed it up with a little comparison sketch and, and sure. sent it through to Todd and Megan. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, <clears throat> great report. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I do have one question, though. How difficult would it be if you could put some, <clears throat> excuse me, not actual dates, but number of months or weeks on the Gantt chart that you just showed from pre design through schematic occupancy and that over that, that range? Would that be difficult for, for you to do? Not at all. Yeah, and it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a hundred percent accurate, but yeah, we, we did already do that once. We sent it to Todd and Megan. Um, it did make it into the report because at that point when we sent it to them, we were giving them some information if we were to have a start date of I think it was May of this year or something. Uh, but no, those each phase has typical durations, and I can easily add that in and send it through. I guess you worship through to Megan. Was this the? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at the chart that you sent through before, uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's more just the month or, yep, yep, or yep. the time that it would take, like, because we don't know when we're going to start. Right. We don't have a date when we're going to kick off, so it's going to be hard. But if, if it's four months for schematic, then if you could, I might be able to get it off of here then, if this is still still accurate. Well, you know, I have the email a while back, so why don't I find that email? I'll scrub out the dates that had been put to it. And, and just as you've asked, I'll put the general months per phase, and then that way it could be used for any start date. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Your yeah, no problem. Okay, Councillor Bates uh, has a question for you. So um, when I looked at the, uh, just now at the uh, costs of the other options, have they been updated? It seems like they've gotten a little bigger than what I remembered. Um, no. The one, two, three. Option um, four obviously didn't change. That's 66 million. No, um, those are the same numbers that, um, like I, I referenced the, I think it was from March of this year, the cost report that we included in that submission. Okay. Um, I don't, maybe it's the, um, these numbers include contingencies. And so maybe the first set of numbers were, were just the construction estimate without a contingency included. I, I, I just, I don't have them, but I thought they were, slightly smaller and if i remember rightly the the whole gantt chart was like two to three years is what i vaguely remember with with construction yes and Councillor barclay's question i think if you compare the size of an indoor soccer field to an arena it's bigger like a single sheet yeah i believe michael had the slide up there and and an indoor soccer field you would fit fit a box lacrosse court within that with with a fair bit of space to spare thank you yes that's correct i i guess i was comparing it to the twin arena building and you know you've got circulation you have other rooms in there um but that's a fair assessment it's having the uh, second floor michael is uh, certainly adds a lot more flexibility to the the use of the facility and, and future uh, 
you know, growth requirements and such, but uh, it's a su substantial amount of area in that second floor if it's needed. There is, and it was also, and I didn't mention this in, in this presentation, but that's also where we were assuming some of the viewing areas would be um, it, for, uh, for like the field house for a competition or an event. The running track might be temporarily closed off and, and mm. temporary bleachers would be installed looking down at the field house. Um, so it, it, it would be, I think, servicing a, quite a few different needs for the building. I, I'll tell you, I, I think it's encouraging what I've seen. I, when, you know, when I think about because we've never, we've never, we've seen a reduced size field house, but it's a little bit concerning that maybe you're going too small. You know, maybe I miss a boat and put something in that. But if we have that flexibility in that upper level to expand on a, another you know, uh, whatever, uh, you name it, indoor uh, soccer field or, uh, you know, the, the options are a lot more, uh, you know, perceivable. But anyways, uh, I, I'm, I'm encouraged with this because I I don't know if the rest, and I kind of got the feeling I from the rest of council that it was, it was questionable whether we replace the old curling rink or not. And and I know there's a lot of people think that it's it's like new, it's not the type of structure that should deteriorate very rapidly, anyways. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it's encouraging to think that we can we can do this without replacing that curling rink because in the, it's in the in the image of the community that there's nothing wrong with our curling rink. Don't spend twenty thousand dollars replacing that, you know. So I mean, I I think there's some great great uh, consideration thoughts here with this concept, but it's just my thought, Councillor Hill. Yes, thank you, Worship. Thanks, Michael, for the presentation. It was great. Um, I guess the reality is, is that we, uh, you know, we look at different budgetary numbers and we start thinking, you know, we want to be closer to, you know, $25 million, but, um, you know, unfortunately, $25 million uh, doesn't really get us what uh, we potentially hope for or, or our needs in our community might be. So uh, I'm glad that we got this. Uh, in my opinion, it's a hybrid of what we've been kind of the, the big grandest thing that we thought of at first to uh, just replacing some some components. So it's great to have the comparables and I appreciate you guys' uh, thorough report. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you for that. And, and, you know, when we first saw the number, we said, well, do we need construction phasing options on this? Um, because aligning a project with a budget is paramount. And when we didn't see the numbers coming in at 25 million, we instantly just thought, well, how, how can we further reduce this? Uh, we know the community needs a, a renewed aquatic center of some type, and it would be great to also provide the field house because it's new amenity, new value for the community. Um, but, but that was the question we were asking ourselves. Does this need to be broken into two construction phases? Um, we weren't really seeing a whole lot of options for re further reducing the size. It was feeling like we were getting as efficient as possible on these two programs, um, but it does need to align with project budget. And, and that is one of the recommendations for next step is, is, is for the town just to say, you know, pick a budget that you feel, you feel good with that, the consultant team needs to uh, ensure the design meets. <clears throat> Any other questions? I, I'm glad to see you've got some uh, pickleball taken into consideration. There. <laughs> they're, they're, they're claiming, I'm being told that ex or retired mayors take up pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> It's growing in popularity everywhere. It's not just retired mayors. It is actually getting pretty popular. So our, our next step, uh, Mr. CAO. If uh, council is comfortable um, to use this uh, report for the future planning, future conversation with next council, we'd ask council to consider making a motion to approve the NSL Multiplex Recreation and Community Center pre-design 
Okay, is someone prepared to make that motion? Your Worship, I, I will make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Barkley. Any discussion? Councilor so, Bates. Yeah, the question I have quite simply is, so we're just re approving it as a report because we've had no chance to keep the ball to look at again. the ways you'd feasibly yeah. finance it or anything else. We're just approving the report as as given. Uh, correct, uh, Councillor Bates. Uh, certainly recognizing councils, a lot of work has gone into this report, so I don't want to minimize that. Yeah. Um, you certainly put into a really good place for our next council to to review this information and and of course administration. Um, supporting council and determine how this could proceed. I think too, uh, CEO Becker, then it's important for us to um, give it, keep it, keep it alive. But it's, I think, our next step has to be, okay, if we're going to take on a forty million dollar project, how do we finance it? And we've got to get more serious on on availability of grants and fundraising and you know funding and that kind of thing before we can make any future council can make any decisions they've got to know what they've got to work with so but uh, we can only talk about it so long till it comes down to the crunch for okay how do we pay for this thing how do we do this you know and just to give council some comfort to your comments mr mayor your worship uh, administration has been working on on those pieces on financial condition uh, financing, uh, what do we need to do to make a, yeah. uh, a debenture payment? Um, so yeah, that work um, has, has started. Turning need to, to hear from new council on, on, on confirming is, this is a priority um, and then advance our corporate uh, um, tools to, to help with that conversation with council once that uh, process has started. Mm -hmm. Okay, does everybody understand the motion then? I'll ask the question and all in favor of the motion. Carried, thank you. Just, just in closing to your worship, I don't wanna if I take the mic here, but I just wanted to uh, commend council for, for your efforts, a lot of hours you put in for this, uh, very, uh, two years really of, of your time. Um, and of course the community, there's lots of engagement pre, uh, reports, um, developments, of course, staff as well, but uh, certainly it's been a really good um, experience working with HCMA and, and partners with this, with this process. Mm -hmm. I agree. Council has been very, very positive in consideration of a well-deserved community facility, I think, and it's will be proud to have. And I'll, before ex, yeah, before exiting, I'll just echo Todd's remarks to say that it, you know, it's been a delight working with administration and uh, and your worship and members of council on this project. Uh, it's really exciting to see how a project like this could have such a large impact in your community. Um, and so, if there's you know any way that we can help going forward, we we you would be more than happy to assist okay. however we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you. But, uh, do we need any more motions on that effect? No? Okay. Thank you, Michael. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Any further discussion on that matter, or have we talked about it enough for now? No? <laughs> it is. It is very exciting. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, operations. Uh, we have an RFD regarding solid waste collection contract with uh, <clears throat> E360S. Yep. Uh, thank you. So uh, we were approached uh, a little while ago with tip from E360 here um, with their expiration of their contract coming up in April. Um, so back in 2019, we awarded the contract to Environmental 360 Solutions um, with a provision to extend the contract for two years. Um, at the time, E360 was the only company that provided rear lane pickup. Uh, over the last couple of years, we have formed a strong working relationship, uh, have gone through quite a process of learning and 
and, and uh, dealing with uh, the residents. Um, but we have felt that E360 has been very responsive uh, in regards to uh, either concerns or complaints from the residents. Um, uh, as I said, we did meet with them uh, in regards to a request to extend uh, the contract. Um, due to an increase in high organic, organic dumping fees, um, they have proposed to decrease the garbage and recycling pickup fees, um, which would reduce the overall cost, overall increase. Uh, I did attach a detailed comparison, um, but in brief, the proposal would increase the overall cost by approximately $405 a year annually, uh, compared to um, $1,525 annually if, if we weren't if we were to just use the existing numbers uh, from E360. Um, we also did a comparison in regards to um, the second lowest bidder that provided us a, a submission in 2019. Um, we did uh, indicate that this still puts them under that bidder's rates from 2019. So, um, Financial impacts, obviously, in 2021, the solid waste contract uh, amount was 688824 This would increase it, uh, as stated, by $405 for next year. Um, so we are looking uh, at council to approve the award of the solid waste collection contract to Environmental 360 Solutions for a two-year term um, extension to expire April 1st, 2024. I'll take any questions. I'll move so that we can just proceed with the questions and I'll move that we proceed with the recommended action of the two-year extension. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just a, a question through to Director Kennedy. Uh, so that 405 is annual for the two years. So it'd be a total of 810 Correct. increase over the two years on the total contract, $810. Thank you very much. Yeah. Worship through to Director Kennedy. Um, we had a site visit to the organic location. I think that was last year, two years ago. But um, I know we spoke at the time about potentially something coming back to the town of Innisfail as far as Megan you can refresh my memory but you know some composting that kind of thing yeah yeah like that we could get compost back from Stickland Farms that people could come and pick up at the transfer oh, okay. station or something yeah, yeah I, I haven't followed up with that okay. so. so would that be separate from this like that would be done with Stickland or that would be separate from okay. this yeah that would yeah. be through through the uh, solar waste providers okay yeah thank you any other question oh I'll ask the question then all in favor of the motion Carrie, thank you. Next uh, item is the uh, RFD regarding the reserve two generator. Yeah, so um, over the last couple of months here, we uh, have been working with that RFP uh, with some local contractors in regards to um, engaging the supply and install of the new emergency generator at res two. Um, currently, the Res2 generator or is a backup pump, a diesel pump that runs the pressure in the water distribution system um, when it falls in below a certain point. Uh, this pump was purchased in 1977. Parts have become very difficult to find. Uh, the new di diesel generator pump or generator would replace the pump uh, and run the two existing electric pumps um, in the event of a power, power failure or interruption. Um, included in the in the project was an option to replace the um, motor control center or MCC panel, uh, which was recommended um, as part of the assessment done uh, due to age and condition. Uh, the request for quotes for the project closed on August 10th. Three contractors submitted bids. Um, Sterling Industries was 900 for 99,920. 
uh, Colicut Energy was the higher bidder at 130,273. Um, the bid evaluation was done by Tagish Engineering. Uh, Sterling did provide the most comprehensive package uh, compared to the other two bidders, therefore was respectfully uh, recommended by Tagish to award to this contractor. Uh, as you see with the to total project cost, including engineering contingency, um, it was $202,335. The project value is over the budgeted amount of $200,000, uh, but there is additional funds available in the utility reserve. Um, with the reduction um, of the additional funds of reserve balance would, for the pro after the project is completed to be 210,815. Um, so it is uh, our recommendation that council approves the reservoir to emergency generator to Sterling Industries uh, for the value of 167,920. This does include the uh, MCC panel to be funded from the utilities equipment reserve fund. Okay. Someone prepared to make that motion. Mr. Versipal moves that we approve the award of the Reservoir 2 Emergency Generator Contract to Sterling Industries Incorporated for $160,920 to be funded from the Utilities Equipment Reserve Fund. Okay, any questions? Oh, Councillor Bates. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, through Director Kendi, one, uh, have we ever had to run both electric pumps at the same time? Uh, I believe that they just cycle right now. Um, and then the emergency pump pumps on. Uh, There's the way that it's programmed right now. Yeah, the reason I was asking, of course, was the capacity that we're trading. We're trading a backup to the pump to just being sure that the electric ones run, right? Okay. Whereas before you could have one electric and the diesel partially helping or whatever, if you needed the water flow. But if, if, if one pump is all we need, then this works. Thank you. Well, you'd have twice the capacity now if you had a power outage. Did you know? No, my point was that if, if either the electric motor or the pump that it's driving, is the failure, your diesel pump was totally independent, whereas you're now gonna have a generator that powers the two electrics. Yeah. And Correct. if one of them was down, and you, yeah. The single pump. One, one has there. to be able to do the job. Yep. Thank you. Your, your Worship, just through to Councillor Harrison, if I was hearing right, I, I thought you, said the award for 160,920 instead of 167. If I did say that, uh, I'll amend that motion. <laughs> I thought it said 167,920. Okay. It's corrected. Okay. Wish if I do have question what's this motor control center for us non-engineers and non-mechanics <laughs> good question um no it, it, it's just a panel that has um it houses all the uh, electrical and also our SCADA components and uh, computers uh, that fits inside so existing uh, panel right now is is located in, in an area that uh, was subject to some water damage so it is in, in fairly rough condition. So this would just replace that. Uh, do, the cost is quite high just because of all the electronics. Okay, thank you. One question, and I'll have, ask this to the CAO, I guess is the, when we, when you, we do this, we're taking funds from that reserve account to pay for it, right? Yes, your worship, that uh, reserves fund was set up specifically yeah. for this type of uh, okay. purchase. Um, um, I'm not sure if Director Kennedy can outline 
other potential purchases from the reserve at this point, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's what that utilities equipment reserve was established okay. for. I don't, I don't want to, I'm trying to picture in my mind because I, I don't, hope we don't, we aren't depleting our res, reserves to buy things. And we, like if there's a surplus at the end of this year with the capital projects, which I'm thinking there, there will be, will that be replaced by that surplus, that reserve spending? I think um, we have not established a reserves policy to outline exactly what amount goes in, but yeah. when you achieve your surplus, whatever that balance is, you can allocate it to where you see fit. Um, this was a budgeted project. Um, Council did review this during your deliberation for the capital budget. It's not a new project. Yeah. So all those pieces were evaluated at that time. If you feel comfortable, we could certainly go back to the capital plan to outline um, where our other purchases and priorities are, are focused on. The only reason I'm making that comment is that we're, we're looking at a serious uh, future project here that the last thing we want to start to do is reduce our our uh, surpluses and you know look, because I've heard that comment more than once this year already that we're we're spending our surplus it's coming down well <clears throat> that's the last thing we, I think we want to do at this point in time yeah I think that's a good comment your, your worship um, however you know that the director indicated during the budget deliberations and he's telling counts right now that this is a 1977 dollar 1977 uh, year piece of equipment. Um, it's you know it's almost my age, uh, <laughs> which is pretty old. <laughs> um, in respects, um, it is of need. Um, it is a liability. We can certainly delay this project if council sees fit. Um, but uh, through administration, we're seeing this as an urgent uh, purchase and replacement. Yeah, no, it's just a comment. Thanks. All right, any further discussion? I'll ask the question and all in favor of the motion. Carried, thank you. All right, moving on to community services road closure. I don't, anyways. Uh... Um, yeah, so we do have two citizens in attendance here for item 7.3. Um, if council was interested, we For 7.3? Yeah. Okay, well, do you want to go ahead with that? Then if first? that works for, for sure, council, so we can do Sarah. that. They've been sitting patiently. All right, so we're looking at a land use bylaw amendment 1470-A74, uh, looking for consideration of first reading and scheduling of a public hearing for this land use bylaw amendment. Uh, so the owners of lot six plan 8500 ET, uh, Vic and Suzanne Cole, uh, have applied to add two discretionary uses to the highway commercial district for this property. Um, Vanessa, if you want to roll to the next page, just so everybody knows what, or the third page, I guess it is, that shows the property. Um, uh, the requested uses uh, to be added are contractor services, major and manufacturing industries as discretionary uses on this parcel. Uh, so the requested uses are intended to accommodate a potential uh, purchaser who would operate a small scale welding shop. Uh, that operation would in be intended to involve uh, mobile welding services where trucks uh, leave the site to perform work at offsite locations, uh, on site repairs and alterations of trailers, vehicles and farm implements, uh, on site fabrication of structures and components uh, for delivery to and assembly at offsite locations and the outdoor storage of materials such as steel and pipe racks, uh, trucks and trailers. Um, so the report includes the bylaw definitions for each of those uses. Um, so contractor services major, this uh, definition really captures the sort of the trucks and the offsite work that would go along with this use where manufacturing industries more effectively reflect, reflects the welding component. Um, so the proposed bylaw will give uh, effect to the applicant's request. And if approved, the two requested uses would apply solely to this parcel and not to other properties designated within the highway commercial district. Um, the applicant's rationale for adding the two uses to enabling uh, this use are uh, summarized as follows. 
So the current zoning of this property as highway commercial, uh, the property is 1.92 acres in size and the current zoning, uh, while it does work for the front piece of the property, which is currently uh, double D trailer sales operates on the front about a third of the property. Um, however, the back piece where the shop is located um, does not fit well with the highway commercial uses for the following reasons. Um, it's adjacent to the town's RV sewer dump and has odor during peak periods of use. Um, and the operation of many of the permitted uses uh, within the highway commercial district are not felt to be suitable. Um, so just for an example of some of the um, listed uses within the highway commercial district, uh, the permitted uses uh, within the highway commercial district include drive-in business, financial services, health services, hotels, motels, offices, personal services, restaurants, uh, retail stores, um, and sales and service outlets for automobiles. Um, so I guess the point the applicant's making in, in their statement is sort of that a lot of the permitted uses that are listed within the highway commercial zoning, um, when you do look at this site, maybe aren't things that would would fit, uh, fit nicely on the space. Um, so the uses to the north, east and west of lot six are a mix of commercial um, and industrial uses and zonings. So the properties directly east and west are both part of the highway commercial zoning. When you go across uh, Lakewood Drive to Stewart Construction, you get into established industrial um, zoning there. <laughs> Uh, residential uses to the south and southwest. Uh, there is a 50 foot uh, wide trail corridor directly south of the parcel between um, between the parcel and the beginning of Madison Park. And then there's the the lot that has the large uh, telecommunications tower uh, to the south as well. So lot six was one of several properties that was changed from industrial to commercial zoning uh, in 2004. The area did begin as one of the community's industrial areas to take advantage of proximity to the rail and former Highway 54. Uh, back in 2004, with the consent of area landowners, um, there was a change to the municipal development plan and the land use bylaw designations to transition to commercial use of this area. Um, residential development to the south and southwest in Madison Park was beginning uh, to get underway at that time as well. Um, so the existing industrial uses in the area, however, do have non-conforming status and are allowed uh, to continue. Uh, new uses were expected to begin to evolve to a more commercial nature. So um, bylaw 1470, A74 includes provisions that administration is suggesting to be considered uh, in response to the applicant's request. So if council is uh, open to the change, uh, administration is requesting a couple of additions as well. So firstly, um, the Highway Commercial District does uh, prohibit open storage yard in yards abutting a residential district. And in addition, the general regulations place limits on open storage yards in any minimum yard abutting a residential district. So this parcel doesn't directly abut a residential district, but due to the proximity to residential, um, we are suggesting that we clarify this through a special requirement for lot six uh, that would allow open storage for the two proposed uses uh, subject to su sufficient screening. Uh, the screening could take the form of fencing and or landscaping. Uh, second, a special provision is proposed to require additional landscaping for visual screening purposes um, for the uses, regardless of whether or not open storage is occurring. Um, so the intent of this provision is to benefit again the residential properties to the south and southwest by breaking up or blocking the view of these industrial uses. So finally, as a discretionary use, um, when the development permit for uh, this property potentially comes forward, uh, days, and, days of the week and hours of operation of the two uses can be subject to limitations uh, if deemed necessary by the, uh, by the development authority. So as with any changes to zoning within the land use bylaw, um, there's a requirement for a public hearing and that notification is provided directly to all adjacent property owners, as well as uh, through our website. So at this time, administration is recommending that council uh, grant first reading to bylaw 1470A74 and schedule Tuesday, October 12th uh, for the public hearing. Okay. Uh, before, 
Were you going to make a motion, or I was going to bring you a point up? You go, you go first, Your Worship. Okay. The, the only point I had, uh, Councilor Hill, was if we have the uh, give this first reading, we have the public hearing on October twelfth. It's not going to reach a uh, council for a second reading until a new council is in place. Uh, council could consider following the public hearing on October twelfth. You could consider second and third reading on the third. Yeah, night. that's what we often do. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That's a regular council meeting. I, yeah. I just make sure because you can't, you can't. Yeah. You can't. <laughs> councils have to, you know, start from scratch. Okay. All right. Councilor Hill. Yes, Your Worship. I would proceed the council grants first reading of bylaw seven or 1470 A 74. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor Beats. Um, I would just a suggestion. I think I would be prepared um, as administration to make sure we're, we're able to address potential noise more than even the visual of a covered storage. Just be prepared to discuss that, I would think. That's, that's, that's my feeling. Just to add to that, so that is one, um, you know, difference between industrial and commercial properties as well. So industrial properties are exempt from from some of our noise uh, bylaws, um, where commercial properties there are some higher standards for for noise. Um, but as Councillor Bates mentioned, yes, um, the development authority at the time of the permit can specify times if they so choose um, for when uh, when certain activities can take place. Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just further to uh, Councillor Bates's uh, question on noise there, that could be handled through screening and landscaping, could it not? Can certainly be, be helped through that, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Will there be any further um, input from MPC then at, after once this is rezoned? Um, so if the if the LUB amendment is successful, um, then the applicant would be able to submit a development permit application that would come forward to, to MPC. MPC, so at that yeah. point, they can, good, good. All right, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, carried. And do you want a separate meeting or motion for the public hearing? Okay, would someone like to move that we give this? Uh... Worship, I'd so move that we right set. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I so move that we set Tuesday, October the 12th, 2021, at 3 p.m. in Council Chambers as the date, time, and place for the public hearing on bylaw 1470 A74. Okay. okay. Discussion, all in favor of the motion. Carried, thank you. Okay, uh, do you wanna then do, uh, which one next, Seven, 7.1? 7 okay, so um, we're looking to present uh, road closure bylaw 1668-2021 uh, um, that closes all of the lane within plan 092 for consideration of second and third readings. Uh, so this bylaw proposes to close all of the lane uh, contained within the plan as shown on your uh, screen. The green outlined area on the air photo below is the lane that is to be closed. It is located at the north, in the north part of Innisfail, uh, just north of 59th Street, running between 48th and 49th Avenue. Uh, land on either side of this uh, section of lane is now zoned uh, established industrial as part of a rezoning that was completed earlier this year. Um, once closed through this process, uh, this piece of land will become a fee simple titled parcel. Um, this, the closure of this portion of lane is needed to facilitate road widening along the east side of lot 12, um, which is the, the lot on the east side there in that image. Um, for the future extension of 48th Avenue. 
following the closure of the lane, the newly titled land um, can potentially be consolidated with lot 11 and lot 12 um, as part of a land transfer with the, uh, the common owner of lot 11 and lot 12. So a road acquisition agreement will be registered on, on the title. Uh, so the, the road can be obtained at the time of construction when 48th Avenue is uh, slated for extension. So the process to close this portion of public road allowance has included um, a notice in the Albertan on April 27th and May 4th, uh, notification of the adjacent landowners and utility companies, uh, public hearing held on May 10th, uh, consideration of input um, by council at the hearing, followed by council's decision to proceed uh, with first reading. Um, the information package with all the comments received by the town is then was then forwarded to the Minister of Transportation in June, and then Alberta Transportation reviewed and approved uh, with the Minister signing off and being returned to the town at the tail end of August. So the final step in the approval process is for Town Council to consider second and third reading of the bylaw. Uh, once the bylaw has been passed, uh, it can be submitted to Land Titles Office. So if approved, the closed portion of the rate of the road uh, may be consolidated with lots 11 and 12 uh, in exchange for the future road widening. Uh, that land transfer would come back before council uh, once the road acquisition agreement has been prepared and discussed uh, with the property owner. So at this time, we're looking in for consideration of second and third reading uh, of this bylaw. Councillor Barkley. Thank you, Worship. I will uh, move that we give second reading to bylaws 1668 2021. Okay, thank you. Discussion. Councillor Morrison. Garrison. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Your Worship. How do we capture the road widening somewhere down the road? Like, will that be a caveat on the Yes, yeah, so we'll prepare a road widening or road acquisition agreement um, that will be registered on title of of the parcel. Um, so then, when we do move forward with construction, uh, that will be that will be available. Okay, thank. You. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion. Carried. Thank you. Your Worship, I'll give. Third, I'll move that we give third reading to bylaw 1668-2021. Thank you, Councillor Bates. All in favor of the motion. Carried. Thank you. Seven point two land use amendment. Got my pages all mixed up here. Okay, so. Um, land use bylaw amendment 1470-A73 uh, is to prevent, is to present uh, land use bylaw amendments for first reading uh, at the recommendation of administration. So administration presented to council back in August, a series of amendments um, that we would like to have council consider <coughs> um, as a way to streamline some of the processes in our bylaw and improve some of the functionality. Um, some of these uh, recommendations, I guess, have come directly from administration, um, from MPC, as well as uh, considerations of the provincial red tape reduction process. Um, so I'll give you just a high level overview of the uh, proposed amendments um, as the bylaw itself is actually kind of hard to read and decipher what's going on in there. So um, the first one has to do with residential care. So the bylaw currently provides use definitions for properties used to provide formal care to individuals uh, who for various reasons are unable to maintain their own homes. Uh, adult care housing is the current uh, wording that we use and it is a discretionary use in all residential land, dis land use districts, excluding the narrow lot district and manufactured home districts. Uh, group home is another current term that we use, is a discretionary use within the R2 and RT districts. Um, the proposed bylaw will amend to remove these two definitions, adult care housing and group home, and will introduce three new uses of residential, of residential care, social care, and assisted living. Um, so residential care means a de 
Development where physical, social, or mental care is provided for four or more persons who live communally for periods exceeding six months and where at least one staff person is at the facility at all times when there is a resident within the facility. This would be added as a discretionary use to the R1A, B, C, uh, R2, R3, and RT districts. Um, so the big difference there is right now our adult care uh, didn't didn't set a number of residents. So basically at this point, if it's care provided for less than four people, um, it would not be deemed a use different than just a regular um, single detached uh, use. So there wouldn't be a permit requirement for those uses. Um, so then social care is the next definition and it means development providing temporary living accommodations to to those receiving supervisory medical or other care on a short-term basis. Um, so this would be added as a discretionary use within the R2, 3, and RT districts. And this definition would include facilities uh, such as hospice, hospices, institutional foster homes, and shelters. Uh, the final addition would be assisted living, means a development that provides limited health care to residents from an on-site health care provider that contains either individual dwelling units or private rooms or combination thereof that includes a communal dining and social space for the exclusive use of the residents and may include accessory manager and or visitor suites and administration office added as a discretionary use in the R2, R3 and RT districts. Um, the next big change was to do with mobile commercial sales. So the bylaw is being amended to not require a permit through the land use bylaw. Uh, for mobile commercial sales, such as food trucks, um, Tabor corn, those types of uses. Um, the current process is quite slow and limits approvals to only commercial lots, which has kind of limited us or forced us to kind of go around our own rules for our public spaces. Um, essentially, the, the business licensing process will be the, the tool we utilize for these temporary uses. Um, Next one is home occupation ones. So currently home occupation class ones are a permitted use in most residential districts. Home op ones are defined as essentially an office only operation that generates no client traffic, additional employees or external storage. Um, as as COVID-19 has demonstrated, many people are working from home as employees of other businesses. Um, so really it's a similar use, whether you're being told to work from home, working for someone else, as opposed to operating your own sort of office only building business. Um, so the bylaw change would make these operations not require a permit. Um, the requirement for a development permit for a home op one will be removed. Um, and this would represent a reduction in red tape and a promotion of small business ventures. So the next one is the conversion of the direct control district A3. Um, so the conversion of this district to the RT district. Uh, this district is very, or this area is very similar in nature to the RT area. Um, many permits have had to go through the MPC process for minor changes in occupancy, um, adding significant time and frustration for applicants. Um, the RT zoning provides a similar range of uses um, with more following within the permitted use uh, listing. Um, the next one is uh, secondary suites. So this is one we haven't had as much discussion on. Um, but the current definition limits secondary suites to detached dwellings only. Um, administration is proposing to change um, to provide the potential that suites could be developed in side-by-side -side duplexes um, in certain districts, um, primarily the RT, R3, and R2, so districts that already do contemplate um, duplexes and fourplexes. Um, We've run into a few situations where we have existing suites in duplexes. And even if they are able to upgrade the suites to meet building code, we can't approve them through our land use bylaw. So it kind of leaves these people in the option to basically just try to avoid us. <laughs> so hoping that this gives a bit of an opportunity to um, get those, uh, those properties inspected and up to code. Um, and gives us a bit more flexibility. So um, you will see in the actual text of the bylaw where it may read secondary suite or it may read secondary suite 
in a detached dwelling only. So in those areas, you wouldn't, it wouldn't work in a duplex. It could only be in a, in a single family home. Um, so then, and then just a collection of a few other updates, some clarification to signs, um, the height of signs in downtown, flag signs, um, clarification of landscaping provisions, um, the elimination of minimum floor area requirements within our residential districts. So we, right now, within the R1B, you have to have a 1200 square foot house or there's, those are specified. Um, and we have had um, people coming forward looking to build smaller homes in some of those, those areas. Um, so that is proposed to be, be removed as, as well. So at this time, again, we're looking for first reading and then uh, scheduling of the public hearing for that October the 12th uh, date. Um, notice of the bylaw will be posted on the website and in the town voice as well. Those direct control uh, A3 properties will all receive direct uh, mail notification. Okay. Uh, someone prepared to make a motion to that effect in this first reading. Your Worship, I would uh, grant first reading of bylaw 1470-A73. Thank you. Councilor Reno, discussion. Councilor Bates. So um, I do have a question, I guess through to Director Jenkins for the, uh, in, a sh in short form, what's the difference between having to have a, a development permit versus not because I, I see that one reference here to this cuts the red tape of having to have a development permit so for the home ones or the mobile so um, i'm referring to more to the uh, residential uh, care so i guess for right now if similar to the appeal hearing that came forward earlier this year um in that situation, that use with the two residents that were going into that home, that use would not require a development permit under the um, under the uh, proposal that we're putting with these definitions. Um, so it would only be once that house has four or more residents that it's deemed that that's a use that has more impact than a standard single family uh, development and would then have to go through a development permit uh, process. Well, and the reason I'm asking is I am recently hearing of concerns of the one that that is functioning. And um, I think the primary concern that keeps coming back to me is that is that there's now a business in the middle of a residential area. And mm -hmm. that, you know, it was it was a residence mm -hmm. it's now a business but is it functioning as a business it to, i guess that's that's the question it's functioning in terms of the impacts on the neighborhood is there's individuals it, that live there and then a, a care person that that comes and goes correct well it, it is a business but it is also disturbing some of them so um due to the the commercial nature of the use or just well it's due to the use in this in this case it's because of care of of individuals as opposed to the care of a resident in that in you know it's yeah it's, it's a it's a business that can have more concentrated uh, use than than if it was just uh caring for a resident a, a specific resident in that business in that house sorry it's now a business and um, yeah, I, I'm just telling you, mm -hmm. I'm hearing concerns about it and it bothers me a little bit to think that we might actually have a less red tape, let's say to, to that particular uh, business going into a, a fully residential area. I guess there's no limitation on, you know, we have businesses that own residential properties throughout yeah. the town. Um, and that the land use bylaw is intended to regulate the impacts of the uses. Um, so if they, that 
I guess in my understanding, I don't live up the street, but that there are one or two residents that live there and there is care provided to them no differently than if if you had someone coming in and out of your home to to yep. provide care, yep. I guess. Yeah, the difference being that that it switched from a residence to a business. That's the concern I'm hearing mm -hmm. as a counselor. Um, I'm not, yeah, I, uh, I'm not saying we should not do the bylaw because of that. I'm just expressing the concern mm -hmm. and um, thinking that you'll probably, I would think you're probably going to hear some of that at the public hearing. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Barkley. Yeah, Your Worship, through to Director Jenkins, I would concur with Councillor Bates and I, I've had some feedback myself that things are maybe not going the way that we were told they were going to go at MPC and that's disappointing, I guess. So I, I'm a little reluctant in this part to reduce red tape and maybe it's, you know, maybe some protection for the town and for people who make these decisions that we remove this part from, from this change. I, I don't know, but. Um, <gasps> Can I ask again what you're hearing in terms of what the the impacts or how the operation isn't? Well, some d disturbance, like noise mm -hmm. that's interfering with other people in, in the area and, and enjoying their property. That's for uh, your worship, uh, Megan's question, is there opportunity to mitigate some of those concerns? Uh, certainly we could become involved administratively, uh, even communicate onto the corporation. Um, we have not heard from citizens directly, but um, if council is hearing that, certainly pass those individuals off and we can certainly mitigate uh, um, any inappropriate um, interactions within the residential area. Yep, so it's it's been a fairly recent bit of information to me and and I'm trying to get that direction. <laughs> um, but again, I just wanted to reflect back that the chief concern is, is accepting a residence as being a residence. And so if, yeah, if, if that resident needs care, that's different than bringing in a business, you know, they're there, they're the current resident owner, um, it's not likely to be multiples at the same time. It's usually going to be the one resident that needs their care in their own home. And uh, the fact that it's become a business is, is uh, grating on some of the people. And visual and noise are the complaints that I'm hearing. I think uh, in defense of uh, the CEO Becker's uh, comment, though, unless uh, like we, uh, the town has granted them permission to do this. And if they're not pertain, you know, complying with, you know, the conditions that were stated, we have to at least give administration the opportunity to, to check into it and follow it up. Yeah, I'm not it's saying that in any way, shape or form. Otherwise, I, I've even volunteered to help be the uh, communication link to administration. Yeah. I still have got nothing concrete to communicate other than hearsay okay and well, that's, that's as soon true. as i can get something concrete i will yeah um, i'm just throwing it out there as a caution that um, if you take any residential area in the town that's purely residential it's not a transition it's it's purely residential and and you have a business in it um that is a market change to the use, and that's viewed that way by the residents. Mm -hmm. and, and we, I'm we, not sure we want to streamline that any more than it already was. That's that's my point. Okay, uh, Megan, these these kind of uh, facilities uh, have been permitted in town and other areas, such as you know, mid midway houses and homes and stuff for younger people yeah we have They're so quite common in town. adult care housing there are 
there's probably six or eight of them at least yeah. um, throughout. And the way um, I believe it's a social housing act is sort of once it's four or more, yeah. then, then they're involved in the licensing of those facilities. Um, and that's, yeah, where you, we have quite a few where, the, you know, there's four five, six, yeah. um, typically adults with developmental disabilities that live in a home and they're licensed through that. This particular example that brought this one to light, they're below that four, so they don't fall under those provincial licensing requirements. It's essentially a, a service that families can utilize this company when they're unable to, mm. to care for uh, their family members themselves um, without um, putting them into an institutional situation. Well, I, think, I think we can thank the uh, provincial government when they downloaded all these, uh, these situations of, you know, of, uh, handicapped people that were to merge them into the communities and closing down the facilities like uh, Michener Center and Red Deer. And, you know, there were some concerns about it, invented it, but uh, I think uh, <clears throat> that's basically, this is just an example of the down, mm -hmm. what can happen and emerging uh, these people that are challenged into established communities. But uh, I don't know what, you, it doesn't make sense to put them in a commercial or a mm -hmm. industrial area either. So. And we do need to be mindful that the, the MGA itself was actually amended yeah. um, that, legislation allowed a land use bylaw it cannot prohibit the regulation of a residential user of a parcel of land so if if someone is using it as a residence um we're unable to say sorry you four adults can't live together in a golden girl setting or these certain people that might have a certain challenge or a certain lifestyle or however they want to live that that a land use bylaw does not have the ability um to regulate residential users as a land use. Yeah, and your worship, I, I just don't want people or anybody here misconstruing what I'm saying. It's not that I'm against this or, you know, uh, I think it's wonderful that we see people being integrated into our communities and, and being included, but I guess I'm a little bit like Councillor Bates. I'm, I'm not sure we want to streamline the process because I, I think it's, it's good to have dialogue and have questions asked to maybe providers that are coming into the community. I, I know the, the one that we're referring to was kind of a surprise. It was kind of getting done without any permit and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So you know, I, I, that, that concerns me a little bit, I guess, that you know, they could be popping up everywhere and, and we don't know what it is or where at least now we've had an opportunity to hear from the provider. We know what we were told at MPC and maybe hearsay or some feedback we've got is that maybe that's not being followed the way we were told it was going to be. Further discussion? Yes, Your Worship. Um, so I guess my question too, um, you know, we talk about reducing the red tape and whatever it may be, but um, whether this residency was, uh, you know, no matter who was occupying it, whether there's a development permit or not, uh, there is still the, to uphold the bylaw of noise and bylaw of, of uh, you know, respecting others' uh, uh, properties and, and whatever else. So I still think that there's, whether there's a bylaw or, or pardon me, whether there's a development permit needed or not, if there is breach of, of noise or any other concern, I still think there are ways of mitigating those concerns whether there's a uh, development permit or not. So that's that's just another avenue that I think needs to be remembered as well. Your Worship, if I may, um, I'm kind of sensing council like a little bit more conversation regarding this part of the report. Um, if so, just communicate that. We can certainly make adjustment to uh, so what Megan is um, reporting to you, uh, I'm looking for a certain direction, but if you wish this component of that report to be brought out of it uh, for further conversation, uh, make sure you understand exactly what this is and what you, you really want. You have a real life example uh, as a reference um, 
you know, that's fair. Just, uh, just ask for what you want. And I think it's important too, to get feedback on, on the, uh, the stakeholders that are involved here uh, and their opinion, if they can be, if we can, if you can approach them, uh, concerns about issues with the neighbors and such, and can, you know. I don't just, want to confuse the yeah, yeah. past with what's being presented to us here. Yeah. It's just no. a heads up that, uh, that I was trying to raise. And I, and I, don't, I don't want to combine the two, that, that other one will have to be dealt with it's it's approved it's there yeah. <laughs> your worship uh so we're at first reading we haven't voted on it yet so you need a motion to take out that section regarding yeah, or yeah, i think that'd be fair councilor harrison i just so we understand all the council where you're at and certainly want megan's um feedback on what that does to what you're presenting um or we take it all back with your direction, but we can certainly, if council is under the impression that part of this report should be deferred to a, for more detailed conversation, you can certainly make that through a, through a, through a resolution. Just for clarification, then I haven't had any complaints on, and now we're getting into the weeds on another residence, but mm -hmm. uh, on that residence, but <clears throat> I'm with uh, his worship there that we have. Well, we have enforcement. Don't we have a noise bylaw? And if it's that that loud, well, why hasn't somebody complained? Uh, I know it's sort of a, you know, the counselor will fix it, but we've all been instructed and we know the process that we, we should be coming through administration. So when I get those type of complaints, the first thing that I suggest to the resident is that have you called administration and lodge that complaint and if they have and if there's not follow-up and i can say that every complaint that i've passed along to administration there has been follow-up and it's there's always a maybe not a sac satisfactory resolution but there's been some kind of some kind of follow-up so you know i i see it as our duty as council council people to to start that and then if we don't get resolution at the administration, then I think it's maybe time that councilmen get involved. And that's a discussion between us and an administration. Thank you. Councilor Harrison, that's the way I've operated for seven and a half years. And uh, it, this is, it, yeah, we, it's wrong that we're uh, tying. I was just giving a heads up that uh, that one would, it tells me in my in, intuitively um, that I'm not sure we want to streamline it in some in some cases. That the fact that we have a problem somewhere shouldn't directly tie to this uh, bylaw. Um, we'll take care of that separately. Well, I just heard your worship uh, from CEO Becker that there could be a resolution to take that section out. So I. If you're prepared to make that motion, we can certainly vote on it. Your Worship, some of um, my input on that would be that um, that there is with granting this bylaw uh, first reading, uh, we would allow that the people of the public for the public hearing um, to bring forward any concerns of things that either have worked or have not worked in the past, and uh, and potentially um yeah bring that to light and and i think that it would yeah i think that i would be comfortable with you know letting it do uh, its sole purpose of the public hearing is hearing from the public so um i personally think it would be to advance this to this process would be i would be comfortable with keeping my motion and advancing it to a public hearing um that's where i stand that's where i stand your worship just an opinion, but I do believe that could even become more complex than our discussion here today. I think some of the public would come and, and absolutely drag that situation into the discussion. Well, that's, I hope that's what we're trying to get them to do is reach out and tell us. Councillor Barkley. Your Worship, I, I would, I, I like the, the other points, um, two through six, I believe it was, 
but I, I would personally like to see number one left out of this discussion and where we could have further discussion about that. I can just add that, yeah, we can we could take that section and, and put it in a standalone bylaw on its own. Um, if there is anticipation that it could be contentious, it might be one that would be better suited to a public hearing date that isn't right before your election. So if we do have to go from the public hearing and not grant those uh, readings, if there's some adjustments that need to be made, that perhaps it should get um, bumped back. So that's that's certainly something we can take those sections out of out of this bylaw. Yeah, and your worship through to Director Jenkins, it's more about, I guess, in, in my mind, whether like Councillor Bates, whether I, I really want to streamline this process. And yes, granted, I probably a few months ago, I, I was thinking yes, but I think some further thought and feedback that maybe this part should not be streamlined. We're reducing red tape in all these other areas, which is wonderful. And as much as we can do that, great. But um, I'm just not comfortable at this point in time with that first part. And yeah, we'll perhaps get um, some legal advice too with the MGA changes as to how those um, differentiations with residential users um, to what degree we can um, differentiate. Well, we have a choice. Do you want to amend this motion then? Yeah, Your Worship, I, I will amend my motion. I, I don't want to force feed or, or push a topic that uh, doesn't need to be forced it should have its uh, fair time and and administration have their time to conduct themselves uh, uh, as according uh, so I would definitely amend my motion um, that we would exclude uh, number one um, and proceed with the rest of the uh, red tape initiatives and your worship just one more thing I, I think it, it's worthwhile modeling it's not that we're saying or I'm saying that we don't want this type of, you know, approved. It's just that keep potentially keep the process that's in place now where it comes through MPC. It's, it's not that we're saying, oh, let's not do this anymore. We can't have these in our neighborhoods. That's that's not what this conversation is about in my mind at all. Okay, well, we have a... And I would even add that that maybe maybe this one will go that way as well, but then at least we aren't tying it to what could be an outside interference right now with the current situation. I think it's I think it's wise to to proceed with the amended motion. Okay. Um, if there's any further discussion, if not, uh, I'll. Uh... Yes, we vote on the amendment initially. So I would uh, call for the question and those in favor of the amendment to the motion as stated. Carried. Now back to the original motion. And we have the original motion would be excluding number one. Is that correct? Correct. You could say reference to adult care, housing, and group okay. homes All right. are relevant to. Yeah. Then I'll uh, ask that uh, those in favor of that motion. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Uh, do we include the public hearing in your first motion? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm assuming you meant it. Oh, your, your worship, I did not state that in my first uh, motion, but. Uh, it could be all inclusive if that was. Uh, I'll make the motion that uh, council set the public hearing of Tuesday, October 12th, uh, 2021 at 3 p.m. the council chambers. In reference to the original motion excluding number one, right? That is correct, Your Worship. Okay. okay. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you. All right. What do we got left here, Megan? I think I'm good for a minute. <laughs> okay. All right. 
let's move on to correspondence. Um, any questions or comments on correspondence? <clears throat> I'm still, all the letters we get in regards to the RCMP and and uh, funding and billing and ret retroactive half millions of dollars. Nobody's made any final decision yet. We just keep getting correspondence that beats around the bush. Have you got any more, CAO Becker? Have you heard anything? Or? No, Your Worship, I would agree. Uh, we're getting closer to the ultimate uh, <laughs> bad news, but uh, they're certainly leaning towards uh, those invoices coming in in the near future. Yeah. Regarding RCMP, that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your Worship, through to Director Vickers, and maybe this is too much of on the spot question, but with respect to the CAPE letter that came and the increases that are coming, do you know offhand what our fees are to CAPE? They were up around three thousand dollars per day. Or... I believe they're around eight thousand right now. I, don't, the, I, I can double check the, the new it's... invoice or what we paid previously. That's what we paid previously. Oh, yeah, okay. it's... From what I'm seeing, Council Brinkley and Tarek as uh, sixty cents per capita, right? Currently, so that's basically. 42. I, I could pull an invoice and bring it in the future. Yeah, I think it's around that 42 to 45 ish, somewhere in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Waste reduction week. Is there a proclamation requirement there? Uh, yes, there is in the package there for the first third week of October. Okay. This, uh, do we want to make a motion to recognize Waste Reduction Week in Canada? <clears throat> Your Worship, I would uh, make that motion. Okay. All right. Everybody understand that one? Okay. All in favor of the motion. Carried, thank you. Any other questions on this correspondence? Not would accept a motion to accept these for information. Let's so move your worship. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Harrison. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you. I'll zip around the table, Councillor Councillor Hill. Yes, Your Worship. Um, yeah, uh, nothing too terribly much to add. And unfortunately, I, I uh, had uh, got a little rained out. Uh, I did partake and see some of the, the car show just a little bit, which was good. It seemed like it was uh, rain or shine. A lot of people passionate about their, uh, their rides, which is great to see. Um, but uh, on, on a little more of a serious note, I, I did want to, I did provide a... Um, some correspondence uh, to our CAO um, uh, stating that uh, all the pending um, or the, 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 the conclusion of the court case for myself has uh, was concluded and there is a letter that was provided to all, all, all council members um, stating that the charges were withdrawn as of August 9th and um, through the Sage Analytics uh, Code of Conduct Review um, it was recommended that I be removed from uh, my committees at that time until the conclusion of the court case. Uh, now that, that it has been concluded and um, the charges were withdrawn and there's no longer any pending charges, I, I am seeking that uh, council 
uh, reinstate me to me to my committees that I was previously on prior to the Sage uh, Analytics um, Code of Conduct review. So that was something that uh, just want to make sure that was clear and concise. How uh, how would you like to deal with that, CEO Becker? Thank you, Worship. Um, confirming that uh, Councillor Hill did provide a, a letter from from legal counsel. Uh, regarding um, that is charges have been dropped as of August the 9th. I did not provide that letter within your correspondence due to, to some other references specifically to Councillor Hill uh, personally. Um, certainly would be retain the letter on file if you wanted to see it, certainly you'd be privy. Um, uh, understanding it is a foipable document, uh, but it will be retained on file. Um, followed by an email request as what you see before you. Um, if council would entertain Councilor Hill's request, it would be through a resolution. Um, and if you would do, do so, then uh, ask or tell us uh, when you would like to proceed through those committee appointments. Um, understanding we have basically a month left within your term. All right, is anybody interested in making a motion that we consider the reinstatement of Councilor Hill on his committee duties? Is the mayor allowed to make a motion? Correct. I would so move. Any discussion? I guess the only question I have is if we could just get a some kind of a little uh, summary of which committees changed and how much I, I don't believe I was on any of the primary responsibilities just to maybe a backup or two and I don't recall the only primary that changed for me was when former council councillor Carrot left I think uh, it's just a matter of going back and looking checking the history so your worship maybe you just think of the wording of the motion yeah. to help with this is there's two things. One, for council to consider their reinstatement, the, the revoking of the previous mm -hmm. restrictions he placed on Councillor Hill. So that'd be the motion. The other one would be to actually appoint him to yeah. committees that he determined. So saying that a little bit more clearly, I'd suggest you, your worship, the motion would read um, for council to revoke the previous restrictions placed on Councillor Hill as a result of the Code of conduct investigation, whatever the numbers were. Um, and basically that. And then if you want to do it today, we can pull up the committees um, to go through that process. Or anyway. can... Yeah, I, I would think you'd probably, if, if there's a chance you can come up with it today, we can talk about it later. Uh, you want to do it now? Pardon me? CAO suggested the uh, the first motion just being. Sorry, your worship. I was just wanting to make sure yeah. that it's 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 uh, follows the expectations, um, and obviously prior to a vote, that I would probably appropriately step out of the room for that vote. I think it would be appropriate. Just, I think it would be appropriate if you yeah, did. Yeah, just wanted just before anyone's votes on anything, I just wanted to make sure that we we stopped and paused for that. So I'll I'll remove myself from this. Uh, okay, thank you, Chambers. So you were so just so that I'm clear that that motion's on on the floor. That's uh, correct. Okay, it's on, so we yeah. can have a discussion around it. Yep. Yeah. I guess what my concern is. <clears throat> wait till oh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could have discussed it with Councillor Hill in here, but the uh, what my concern is is it is the timing of it. We have a month before, uh, a month and a little bit before we establish new committees uh, or new representation on committees. And I really don't know what kind of meetings we're gonna have over the next month that 
at the committee level. And, you know, over the past little while, these some of these committees have been thrown into a bit of a, a turmoil here with changing members and getting members up to speed or council members up to speed. So that's my concern. I, I certainly don't have an issue about the reinstatement, but it's, it, it's, it's the timing of it. And the reinstatement is, is something that we had discussed when he went through the code of conduct. And I believe we all agreed that, you know, if he was cleared, then, you know, he could be reinstated. It's just the timing of it. You know, we're five weeks away from an election. What, October 27th, we'll be sitting down to, the new council will be sitting down to talk about committees and, and, and structures at the organizational meetings. So is it, are we just gonna throw more turmoil and chaos into what we've got going for the next five or six weeks? That would be my comment. Thank you, Your Worship. All right. Your Worship, I would concur with that. I, I think we've been through a lot of turmoil on this council the last four years, and you know, committees are affected, the community is affected by that. And and you know, we I, I don't even see any meetings coming up on the upcoming events other than what we heard from UCO Becker with respect to the police committee, but that's for all of council. So I just think we're kind of doing this. It's almost like an administration task without really anything coming out of it. And you now have a person that hasn't sat on the committee for several months and now they come in at the very end. I, I would rather see us just leave it. And I, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but just leave it. Let's carry on, finish the, the this term up another three weeks to go basically, and then carry on from there. Any other comments? Well, I guess I'm having a little difficulty with the, yeah. I, I don't think there's, I don't see any many committee meetings happening. Um, but on the principle of reinstatement, as far as, yeah, that was kind of spelled out before. I'm not against, I'm certainly not against the specific motion that the mayor put forward. Uh, that that uh, yeah that because it specifically said once once the charges were cleared that he would be reinstated. So I think the mayor's motion was to reinstate him, uh, and then as to how we figure out which meeting starts when, yeah. that may that that being a separate issue, I would support the motion as the current motion. I think it's uh, as for your comments, Council, to really get, get those words correct. Um, I think the mayor, you know, reinstate, but I don't know if it really concluded. I want to make sure we hear specifically what what those words would be. Um, again, from an administrative perspective, here two things. So you can, you know, you can talk about appointments uh, that it is appointed to this committee, this committee, this committee. That'd be an end result, but the initial motion I'd recommend would be a motion to repeal the restrictions placed on Councillor Hill as a result of the code of conduct investigation with the number of whatever that number was. I can't remember that number, but so basically you're repealing those restrictions that you apply to Councillor Hill as a result of the code of conduct and as a result of his uh, um, criminal code charges. Um, and then you can decide if you wish to proceed further with the appointment to actual committees. Well, I support the motion as worded in that fashion, for sure. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, I, I totally No, clarify. but that's clarification you, you that we need. fulfilled needed. my intent, that's all. Yeah. I just, um, and I'll, I'll speak for the motion in that regard, that I just think that he's lived out his, uh, his uh, I guess, situation and done it properly. And uh, we did say to him that he would be reinstated if he was found clear of all charges. He has been, and, and unfortunately, there's an election coming up. But uh, and and I'm sure in his mind, he's he wants to be cleared, and uh, it, I think it's our responsibility if we have no serious reason not to, and we should follow up on that agreement. Okay, uh, there's four of us here. I guess I'll ask. Uh, the question and those in favor of the motion.
All in favor, thank you, everybody. And we will spend some time reviewing his, his committees. Right now, there's some difficult times and maybe it's not a good time to change committee representatives with only a month left in our terms, which I totally understand. And I'm sure Councillor Hill will too, that well, just for the sake of getting on a committee for one month, let's, you know, let's work, work together on this. Okay, I'm sure you'll understand that. But at least we'll appeal to him on that regard. Okay, do you wanna maybe ask if, uh, Ken, do you mind? Okay, did you have anything else to report, Councillor Hill? No, Your Worship, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bates. Okay, so uh, last week I had MPC, um, the special council meeting with the IDP with uh, Red Deer County. Uh, had an enjoyable day of Rotary Golf. Uh, I also attended the candidate information uh, session. Um, I did not attend the federal forum. It's a sad reflection. I think that that it was canceled. A sad reflection somewhat on our town. Um, and this week I have both the executive and the general uh, Red Deer River Municipal User Group meetings on Thursday. I think that's all. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, your worship by the MPC last week and uh, attended the joint Red Deer County meeting, IDP, and of course the candidates information session. And I did attend the federal candidates forum. And um, it was a terrible reflection on our community without question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, your worship. I also attended the uh, IDP public hearing and uh, good work to Megan and her her staff for bringing all that together. That was great. Also the candidates orientation. Uh, I did get a, about 45 minutes in between rain showers at the car show. So like uh, I agree with Councillor Hill that those guys really take a lot of pride in, uh, in their vehicles. I also uh, attended our inaugural age-friendly community committee meeting on September the 8th. And I'll tell you, I was very uh, impressed with, you know, the quality of committee members. And I really think this committee is, uh, is gonna be a dynamite committee. Uh, uh, we spent two hours, we uh, sort of a, a meet and greet with committee members, but we had a presentation from uh, Rob, and correct me uh, if I get this wrong, Megan, but me, Euro Shiro from Lethbridge, and uh, he looks after their age-friendly uh, group in in Lethbridge. There, I believe he's a councillor, isn't he? Yeah, he sits on city councillor or on city council, and he gave us about forty-five minutes of sort of the ups and downs of what we might expect as we embark on this journey, and some of the, you know. Uh, the pitfalls that uh, they ran into his community when they were putting it together. So it was a good initial presentation. He shared a number or, or a few of the materials that they've used in their uh, uh, formation of their committee. Uh, so uh, they were sent out last week and I believe all the committee's members are reviewing them. We elected a chair. It's sort of a, a funny a funny chair. It's a co-chair, and it's due to timing requirements. It's Brent Jackson and the lady that runs home care. Yeah, I, I didn't catch her name. But yeah, both are very busy individuals, and they, they both felt that they couldn't give 100% to the meetings, like be able to make them but one of them be, should be able to. So I think there's gonna be a partnership there on, on sharing the meetings. Uh, 
our next steps were, uh, we're, we're looking at a Community Action Planning Health Canada grant. And uh, we're th all thinking about an age-friendly project. And our next meeting, we have two meetings before Christmas. Well, one uh, before the election, and it could be a new council person on that committee after October 18th. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that that was about it. Like I say, that's, uh, I think it's going to be a pretty dynamite committee. Uh, the, the people that were around the table, and I do have their names if you're interested. It was uh, Diane, Ron King, uh, Brent Jackson, the home care rep, uh, Doris, and uh, Lucien. And they're all really keen and motivated to get, get going here. So uh, we're going to give administration, I think, some work to do. So just another task for Megan and her crew, Sandy and Karen. So I've said enough. Uh, I think that's, thank you very much, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Your Worship, I have a question for Councillor Harrison. With respect to the age-friendly, um, and I didn't serve previously when they had that uh, discussion, um, does that include engaging with some of the younger people as well, or is it just slanted towards senior age friendly? I know it does. It's not directed totally at Innisfail seniors. Age friendly means we have from youth right up. Good. And we talked about that at, at the meeting there, and, and we can't lose sight of that. Uh, the younger generation, you know, the 45, 30, it's all inclusive. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Harrison. Uh, I too uh, um, enjoyed the open house we had with the uh, County of Red Deer on our fringe area, IDP. And I think it was a good productive meeting, some interesting conversation. The people and uh, I think it went quite well. Um, the water commission uh, situation, I think I pointed out at, previ at a previous meetings that uh, there was still some outstanding funds coming from the uh, provincial government. And uh, there was, um, well, there was a, a three, $3.4 million shortfall in, in the construction and the province came back with us a letter last week saying that uh, they would support that, uh, that but need some time. So anyways, they, they've got that ironed out, which made the Water Commission quite, quite happy about it to affect their cash flow. So anyways, that was good news. Uh, there will be more to come on that, more official. Um, don't think I have anything else. Um, Stephen, have you got anything going on projects or? Currently just uh, 37th Street is still underway. Uh, the ball, ball Diamond 7 upgrade is is near completion. I have a meeting with that one this week to find out, find out if we're gonna be moving ahead with the fence or not this year. Uh, it might get carried over next. And then uh, just waiting on Apollo to get going on 50th again. So they've been definitely delayed quite a while there. So other than that, um, yeah, that's it. Erica? Um, just the, the survey, um, the phone calls have been completed. Um, we got just over 250 um, survey applicants, I guess. They were about ranged about 24 minutes long. So uh, the comment was that Innisfalians really like to chat. <laughs> so, <laughs> but now Ipsos will be working on the document and then we'll be bringing it uh, in the future. Very good. Um, just an update. So the pool reopened today after its two week uh, shutdown. Um, the, there was a little delay on the hot tub, but it should be open tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow afternoon is the final market on Main, and Devin Cooper will be performing from our corner lot. Um, skating starts in the arena on Friday. And yeah, and there's also plans for next Friday. There's Hillside Vibes is a concert that's going to take place down at Centennial Park on the evening of the 24th. So. Ken, everything's cool. 
<laughs> and in the audience here, are any potential candidates there? <laughs> Two. I am oh. just, I'm, I'm so pleased to see that we've found, you know, enough, some more people came on board because when it was sitting there it was, you know, that we're going to end up acclimation here. And then boom, we got some good uh, candidates. So welcome. Good luck. Any comments? No? no? You can see where you can straighten things out a little bit here. <laughs> okay. Anyways, Vanessa, you got anything? No. I do, Your Worship. Uh, you I did have a meeting with a um, lady named Alicia Fox. I know you had a little bit of engagement, uh, just some sidebar conversations. She is the, um, she works for the Rural Health Professionals Action Plan, so RPAP. You've heard of RPAP. Um, she's new to the community. Um, she's looking to, to have a chat with council. Um, so I'm just posing, do you want to meet with uh, Alicia? Formally, informally, certainly, you know, you could dial in just uh, in, a, in a quick coffee if you like, or if you want to bring her into the chambers um, or, or defer, uh, not not do that, but um, certainly she's quite engaging um, and is looking to learn more of the community and want to have a chat with council. So I just put it to you how you wish to, to, to meet with Alicia, and if you do. Okay. Your Worship, I, I would like Alicia to um, come formally and do a presentation to us. Yep. Should we suggest she do two? <laughs> like, depending on when she does the first one, she may need to do two. <laughs> you likely, uh, Councillor Bays, due to the time, but if, if you'd like to speak to her, certainly just give me the nod and I'll, I'll um, ask her when she's available for a, either an AMP meeting sure. or a council meeting. Good. Okay, we'll make that happen. All right. Any, anybody out there in uh, Cyberland? That's... No. Okay. Well, I guess uh, we're done in like session, upcoming events. And uh, I guess uh, next motion would be to go in camera. So I'd like to move. I, I will move we go in camera. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Barkley. Can we take about a five minute break, please? Thanks for coming. Play. Don't put it on play. Don't take it to play. Don't make the time to make the